Machines That Fail Us, a podcast by the Human Error Project at the University of St. Gallen about the human rights implications of AI, errors and failures and our future with artificial intelligence. Welcome to the second episode of Machines That Fail Us. My name is Philip Di Salvo. I am a researcher at the University of St. Gallen and a member of the Human Error Project team and the host of this podcast series. The Machines That Fail Us podcast aims at answering one question. What are the implications of AI errors for society and what do they tell us about our future with artificial intelligence? In the first episode of our podcast, we discuss where our research project has brought us in the understanding of how our society is coming to terms with the fallibility of AI and algorithmic systems and the limits of these technologies when it comes in particular to reading humans and their behaviors. Today, we will focus on the media and on how journalists are making sense of AI errors, how they are reporting about the critical sides of artificial intelligence and what are the main challenges they face when it comes to convey the complex and sometimes contradictory repercussion of AI for our society. Also by looking beyond hype and the mythological views about the technology. For this episode, I'm very happy to be joined by Melissa Heikila, a senior reporter at MIT Technology Review based in London and one of the leading reporters covering artificial intelligence and its societal impacts. Before joining the MIT Tech Review, Melissa worked for Politico and The Economist. It's a great pleasure to have you with us on Machines That Fail Us. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me on the show. So the first thing I wanted to ask you is about artificial intelligence as a topic of coverage. And in your view, uh, what makes it peculiar compared to other issues also beyond technology? And I think that at this point in the evolution of AI, we can definitely all agree that it is no longer just a technological topic or issue. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. I've been covering AI for four years now. And for the first two and a half of those years, it was a very niche nerdy topic. You know, you'd mention AI, people would be like, oh, interesting. You know, they're being polite. <laughs> and it was kind of science fiction-y. And, you know, for the past year and a half, it's front page news. So it's become extremely mainstream. And I feel like everyone has had a concrete example and felt for themselves what this technology can do. And and have had a chance to play around with it. And yeah, it is very interesting because AI has been affecting our lives for a long time. We just haven't really realized it. We're taking a lot of AI for granted, like machine translation or audio transcription or even autocomplete. But now with generative AI, we're really starting to see what this technology could be. And we're starting to imagine futures that are maybe more exciting than we've been able to imagine before. And with that comes obviously immense um, economic pressures from tech companies to make money and invest. And um, I feel there's been a massive, not just cultural, uh, like um, economic, but also a cultural shift in, in the way we see this technology and the companies doing it. I think there's a lot of hype <laughs> for sure. And very, very interesting power dynamics in, you know, who gets funded, which companies are investing, what companies, but also like on the policy governmental level, like there's very interesting geopolitics happening, you know, which countries are investing, which countries are regulating, which countries are hacking each other using AI. So it's an incredibly broad umbrella term, which makes it so interesting to cover um, and also very challenging to cover because there's so, so many things to write about. And recently, with the final approval of the European Union Artificial Intelligence Act, I think we clearly saw all of this coming together with all the pressure from politics and the economics that you just mentioned. So do you think that's a turning point in this discussion? Yeah, for sure. I think uh, when I started covering AI, I started at Politico in Brussels, and I was one of the first reporters to cover the AI Act. Um, and then, you know, AI Act, when you would say you're working on AI policy, people's eyes would glaze over and it was very, again, abstract. And last year was a massive year for regulation. People really understood that, you know, we need to learn something from the mistakes we made with social media. And this is a technology that is potentially very powerful and needs to be regulated. So, yeah, um, it's really great to see how excited people have been about regulation. 
Yeah. And at the end of uh, 2022, we publish our first report uh, that is, by the way, on the human error project.ch. And it deals with how European media do cover AI and algorithmic profiling in general. And we found out that the hyped and sometimes sensationalistic takes on the technology are still dominant in the coverage, while uh, the reporting on critical issues such as biases, discrimination and other errors, as we call them, is emerging but still limited. So do you think that journalists covering AI are effectively doing that in a kind of right way, if we want to, to say, or are we at the moment still losing the opportunity to explain to the public what is really at stake with AI? I think it's a mixed bag. Like on one hand, I'm super happy that there are so many more AI journalists now and newsrooms are really prioritizing it and getting why it needs to be covered because this this technology and these companies need scrutiny. They need to be held accountable. And journalism is a very effective tool for that. But on the other hand, there is, as you say, so much hype and so many traps that journalists can easily fall into, especially, you know, if you're new to the beat. And so I think a lot of newsrooms are kind of falling into that hype trap and sort of repeating company talking points or, you know, maybe hyping up the capabilities or the risks more than is maybe useful. So yeah, it is a mixed bag, but I think I am optimistic. I'm hoping journalists, as they get up to speed with how the technology works and how it doesn't work, that we'll get more high quality reporting. And investigative journalism has been playing a major part in this conversation, especially when it comes to the field of algorithmic accountability. So the niche of this reporting that is actually going after the technology, looking into the code and the inner mechanism and the functioning of the most controversial AI and algorithm systems to see what in fact is going on with this technology that's too often are black boxes that we don't know enough about in terms of transparency. And this kind of investigation has brought some very extremely interesting insights in the past few years. And I would like to ask you, why is this niche of reporting, if we want to call it this way, so important? And are there interesting examples that you want to bring up to the attention of the listeners? I think it is so, so important because we humans have this very natural tendency to believe in computer systems or believe in the capability of computer systems, even when the system is wrong. You know, you've probably heard of death by GPS. And now we're seeing, even before generative AI, we've seen AI rolled out in our public services, in our justice system, in policing, in schools. And these systems are not mature. They're extremely biased, and we've seen some catastrophic failures already, you know, before this wave of AI. You know, we've had plenty of cases in the US where innocent people, most of them are Black, have been failed by the justice system and falsely arrested because the facial recognition system flagged them as being somewhere where they definitely weren't. Um, In the Netherlands, there was this awful, awful case um, a couple of years ago where an AI system flagged people who were suspected of committing benefits fraud and then started charging people these benefits back, often amounting to hundreds and thousands of euros. And it led to children being taken um, into foster care, people committing suicide, divorces. It affected hundreds and thousands of people. And it was because of a quote-unquote AI system that was there to detect fraud. And it was just extremely biased. And obviously, people of color and with immigrant backgrounds were most affected. So, for example, the Dutch case and a lot of these facial recognition cases have come to light because of investigative journalists. And I think it's really, really important to tell these stories and to be really vigilant to bring these cases to light. You know, the Dutch case went on for years until the story came out. And some of the damage can never be repaired. <laughs> um, but in in the more sort of, if you want to think about this wave of AI, some really fantastic work has come out um, from the Washington Post on what goes into the data sets of these um, AI models. Time had a fantastic piece on looking at data annotators. So people working mm-hmm. in Africa who have to often sift through extremely violent and you know upsetting content to train these models for next to nothing. And that was a fantastic story on the human element of AI. You know, it is not just a perfectly neutral technology, like clean technology. It actually needs a ton of human labor to make it work. And at whose expense does that come? 
I think those are questions we need to be asking ourselves. It goes back to what you were saying at the beginning, that a huge part of what AI is, is power dynamics. And when it comes to how to effectively report on, on these systems, and looking beyond the tech itself, the power element in it is still to be in a sense, discovered, probably, and definitely to be communicated. So there is definitely a point where all of this becomes extremely political, in a sense, and really goes beyond tech. And I wonder what you think about this. Oh, it's all about power. I mean, the tech is just like a, ni a nice side effect. <laughs> But it's all about power. Like, you know, this is... Um, a lot of it is American soft power. Lots of companies want to be good at AI because they want that power. They want, I mean, they obviously want the economic benefits, but it, it is ultimately up to like down to power. And that's what makes this just a really fascinating time to be covering and thinking and researching this topic. Yeah. And in particular, if we look at uh, academic research emerging from the critical AI and critical data fields, biases, discrimination outcomes, and other issues that, like the ones that we have just discussed have been now clearly, clearly identified, investigated, announced, and brought forward. And everybody from research to journalists, etc., they all agree that these are not glitches. These are not like technical problems that can be fixed with an engineering mind or by fixing a few lines of code. But there are symptoms of broader systemic societal issues replicated and accelerated by the technology. And this is an extremely different message to convey if you are a journalist covering AI because everybody is going crazy about uh, ChatGPT, everybody is fascinated about what we could do, but actually we are probably automating inequalities, as a great book by Eubanks said already a few years ago. You as a journalist have been covering these issues for a while. What are the challenges that you find when it comes to send this message to the people and what are the best strategies that journalists can follow in order to do this in an effective way? Yeah, I think it really comes down to explaining how the technology works and how it doesn't work. And once you do that, I think it becomes really, really obvious how these errors creep up and, you know, maybe you shouldn't use this to, I don't know, give out benefits or do anything critical. For example, people have been talking a lot about using uh, generative AI in search engines. But when you start talking about it, this is how the data comes in, you scrape it from the internet, this is how it goes into the model, how the biases get amplified, the more examples they see, and how these models work by predicting the next likely word in a sentence. They don't have understanding of context or, or even understanding of what the word is, right? They can't reason. And they also make stuff up regularly. And so once you like break it down and go into like, here's how it works, then it just becomes a lot clearer to make an argument, like maybe you shouldn't trust these models to do anything that requires, for example, factual information. <laughs> Great, use it for creative stuff, but, you know, it, they're not there yet. You mentioned factual information, which is also one of the issues that are mostly involved in this conversation, because these errors that artificial intelligence create can also be used for disinformation campaign, and they are causing already more troubles in the broader context of information disorder. So we are now entering a phase where machines can create content and mislead us and whatsoever. So there is also discussions already going on about the impact of generative AI for mis and disinformation. And I fear that there is there already some, some hype, like we are over preoccupied with these issues. And do you think there is evidence already that generative AI is making things complex when it comes to mis and disinformation, or is it still a kind of far away scenario? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we're already seeing, you know, deep fakes, like deep fakes have become so much more easier because of this generation of generative AI. You can take someone's LinkedIn profile photo, put it in a deep fake machine and create like a pretty convincing porn video. So we're already seeing that. I think this year with all the elections will be a big test mm -hmm. <laughs> in not only, um, like on the platforms, particularly how their content moderation works and whether they allow political content to be created and what our landscape will look like. But, but these are not new problems, right? These are problems we've been tackling with, like battling for a long time. I think generative AI will maybe just make it worse and easier than ever. Um, and I think there's also something that really <laughs> concerns me is like increasingly we live in an information ecosystem where the things we see online are just fake. 
you know, like you can't, it's, it's getting harder and harder to trust what you see. And I think AI will exacerbate that. And so I've been thinking a lot about how to fix this. And it's just really tricky. Like on one hand, you have to tell people, don't believe everything you see, look out for these things, but everything is sort of really easy to tweak and, you know, a spoof uh, and a concerning like the result of that might be that people just don't believe anything. And then where do we end up? It's probably even worse. Um, so yeah, I'm very glad I'm not a policymaker or anyone who has to think about solutions for this because it does seem like an extremely difficult problem. Yeah, I was reading a story a few months ago. I think it was on Wired and it was tackling uh, examples of gen AI created content in the context of this info. And they were saying, well, this is very, really, really, really minimal. But if only one of these things reaches the public and you lose the trust of the public, then everything can be fake. Uh, and maybe we should really, as you were saying, start in a conversation about how to deal with an ecosystem where these things exist instead of focusing on like how to stop it in specific cases. This is going to accelerate for sure. And we will see these kind of things accelerating as much as with deepfakes, as you mentioned. But in the context of politics and political campaigns, what are the scenarios that you think are more concrete on the horizon at the moment? Well, we've already seen political candidates using or, or their campaigns or people associated with their campaigns using deep fakes, you know, to discredit um, their opponents. There were elections in Argentina and Slovakia, and I think there have been some already in the US relating to Trump using these deep fakes. So that's tricky. I mean, who knows what could happen? I mean, you could have a AI generated image of a shooting somewhere and that could cause some instability, you know. There was that deep fake of a fire at the Pentagon and that sort of created panic in the stock market until we realized it was fake. So I think we're in such a volatile political situation. I don't think you need much. <laughs> and that's why it's really important that we've now, I've been really encouraged to see efforts in watermarking and mm. content provenance, which is great. I mean, it's not perfect. It's still a very new, immature technology. But honestly, at this point, anything is better than nothing. <laughs> <laughs> that's true that's really like the moment of revelation of all of this probably and uh if we talk about journalism in the context of ai uh, we also need to tackle about how all of this is entering the journalistic field so ai is going to have an impact on pretty much everything in our society hype aside but that's going to happen somehow so since we already have newsrooms and publishers using AI for producing journalism or assisting journalists in producing journalism. I mean, it's easy to say that AI will change journalism, but is it actually the case? And where do you see this is already probably somehow happening? Yeah, I think it's going to change our industry for sure. How? I'm not entirely sure yet. I mean, we've seen some examples of some newsrooms um, using generative AI to write stories. Some have been explicit about it, some haven't. And <laughs> the ones who haven't opened about it have usually ended up in embarrassing mistakes, plagiarism, <laughs> that kind of stuff. BuzzFeed started using generative AI to generate quizzes and some stories. And well, you know, not sure if it's related to generative AI, but they're not doing very well. You know, they've been hit by layoffs. I, they barely exist anymore, which is just really sad. And, you know, I've tried to use generative AI, like language models to do my work, like in good faith, I've been like, okay, yeah. could you help me write this story? And it just can't do that right now. It's like, it could be maybe really good in writing emails or something shorter or, you know, more formulaic, but with the kind of journalism most journalists do, where you have to interview people, you have to put stuff together, you have to like, it has to sound not like a computer or not generic. This generation of technology is not there yet. Um, but I will say I do use other kind of AI in journalism. I use, I love Otter, which is an audio transcription service. I use that all the time. That's it's made my life. Yeah. I know, right? It's <laughs> game. I could not live without it. And, you know, yeah. in Google Docs, I'm already seeing lots more AI, like um, autocomplete. I don't know if it's really sped my work up, but, you know, it's, it's interesting to see. So, I think our industry needs to think about how we want to use AI and whether it's actually useful right now, especially um, it probably isn't useful for text generation because 
just like the hallucination problem and the, the need to be factual. And I think we also need to be very, very wary of um, the privacy implications of this. Like if you have sensitive material, you just don't put it on any <laughs> uh, cloud-based service um, mm. because that would probably get leaked or could end up who knows where. So we really need to be thinking about that. And then there's a broader question, I guess, about the whole industry. You know, um, some newsrooms have made deals, like Politico, my former employer, has made a deal with OpenAI that they, um, OpenAI can train their models on Politico yeah. content, right? And maybe that's a sort of licensing-based deal. Um, other newsrooms, like the New York Times, have sued OpenAI for scraping their content. And that, I think, is a big question, like to scrape or not to scrape. And, you know, what will that do to our information landscape and our media earning models? Um, I don't know the answers to that. Um, but I think that will be a big fight. And also, you know, tech companies want people to stay on their site. Like Google used to want to direct people to other sites. Now they want people to stay on the Google page. And if you're interacting with a chatbot on google.com that can easily retrieve stuff from news sites and summarize it and blah, blah, blah. And that kind of dis disincentivizes people to go to news sites. What will that do to our earning models? So that big, big existential questions we need to think about. And I think the media industry needs to wake up very soon, unless we want to be eaten up by <laughs> big tech. Yeah. And maybe when it comes to the relationship between human journalists and the machines, uh, I think the good way forward, if we can have some hope, is that machines will literally assist journalists in doing the work. And we have some examples where investigative reporters using AI tools to dig into data sets or satellite images whatsoever. But the conversation still seems to me to go more in direction or we are all going to be automated. Uh, machines will destroy human journalists. We are not going to need them anymore. And that is science fiction, I hope. What, what do you think? Oh, 100%. I mean, may, who knows, maybe I'm just extremely biased. <laughs> but no, I honestly, like every time there's been a new technology, there's been some sort of moral panic, right, about it. Yeah. And I think this is it. These AI systems, I hope, will be really powerful tools that can augment us, you know, that can help us do our works better. And as you say, sift through massive data sets and help us find connections. Fantastic, all for that. But an AI can't go out into the world. It, it's like limited by the data it sees. Uh, and it's been trained on, on the internet. And like the zeitgeist of the moment, it's retrieved that data. It can't go out into the world. It can't, you know, tell you what the weather is like, or like describe how it sounds like, you know, on a spring day in London or yeah. whatever. Um, it can't talk to people. It can't uncover it, information that isn't, someone hasn't typed. So I think there will will be like we'll always need that we'll always always need that and yeah i don't think that's that's why i'm optimistic about the future of journalism yeah so humans in the loop when it comes yes. to journalism for sure. exactly <laughs> yeah <laughs> one last question for you to close this great chat with you today and it's it's a broad question kind of philosophy oriented but um, if you look in the future of, of our society and now we have evidence and clear examples of how AI can be seriously problematic for the lives of many people, usually already marginalized people. What is the greatest concern you have uh, following the way forward in the future? Where do you see that these errors, the biases, the discrimination problems may be more problematic? And what should be done in order to avoid these potentially very bad scenarios? Yeah, I think in tech there's this um, narrative that this is all inevitable. And this is progress. Mm. And this is what we need to do to move forward. And I think we need to be asking ourselves, is it really? And how should we do it? And why? And at whose expense does it come? Um, I'm really concerned that we fall into this inevitability um, trap. And, you know, we start adopting technologies to do really important, critical things that just aren't suitable for that or aren't ready. And they just glitch and fail and fail us catastrophically. Um, I mean, we're already seeing it, right? We Like examples we talked about earlier on this show. And I think, yeah, if we put too much faith in these systems, we'll see even more of that. And that really worries me. I also worry about the human element of it. Like if we're, we're so obsessed with productivity, you know, and mm. like 
do we really need to be that productive, you know, like to make money, like who are we making money for? What are we doing? Like, I really hope that it doesn't go into a stage where AI does all the fun and creative stuff and humans do the boring annotation stuff. It should be the other way around where humans can harness this technology to have more time to do the nice things we like to do that are uniquely human, that allow us to be creative and social and, and whatnot, um, instead of um, just clogs in a machine. Like, we should probably just use actual machines for that. So yeah, lots of anxieties. <laughs> There was my last question and it was great to have you with us today. Thanks for joining Machines That Fail Us. Thank you so much. It was a great conversation. The Machines That Fail Us podcast is produced by the Human Error Project team in cooperation with the Communications Office of the University of St. Gallen, while the post-production is curated by Podcast Mide. This podcast is made possible thanks to a grant provided by the Swiss National Science Foundation Agora Scheme. The next episode of the podcast will be released next month. You can listen to all the episodes of Machines That Fail Us on the University of St. Gallen website, the Human Error Project website, and all major audio and podcasting platforms. This is Philip Di Salvo, the host of Machines That Fail Us, and on behalf of the entire Human Error Project team, thank you for listening. <laughs>